on the theme tune, just so you know when it's coming. <laughs> Pal! Pal! Episode five, already. How time flies. When you're, when you're having a, some fun. Yeah. yeah, it has been fun, I feel. I think we've had some good guests. I was trying to be funny, Chris. I'm mainly enjoying myself. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to that. <laughs> um, but we have upgraded our studio today. In, in, that, that, in that we're in an actual studio. We are, because our budget, we've got so many listeners already, like billions of listeners, we have decided to upgrade to an actual studio. Look, look, look. That's, oh, that's a symbol from an actual an drum kit in the actual, actual studio. drum kit. It's been soundproofed and everything, and we have the luxury of this entire studio for the next hour. So we should have very little problems in terms of our audio, which has been an absolute nightmare for you. Oh yeah, a living hell. <laughs> <laughs> but what we also haven't done properly, I don't think, as, as podcast, podcast hosts, is actually tell people how they can subscribe, which is probably a, a very important thing for us to do, considering that... they'll be tripping over each other to get there, Chris. They're, they're, precisely. They're literally, in, in tears, trying there to figure out There will be people waking up in the middle of the night, sweating, because they just don't know how to get our next episode. So, for those of you that are like that, we are on iTunes, and we are on YouTube. And you can subscribe by hitting a button that quite cleverly says subscribe. It does. It does say that. Um, and you can also leave us a review on iTunes, which would make us extra special and more popular. That's what I've been told. Uh, yes, okay. apparently so. And we do like to be popular. And if you're not a Apple person and you are an Android person like myself and Will, we also feature the episodes on our website, which is www.beyondtheultimate.co.uk. And you can download it from there. It's really, really easy. Even, even I can do it. Even Chris can do it. So, you know, that must be easy. Yeah. And that's, I felt like I was being professional there. That was a very professional start for the podcast. It was, yeah. But uh, I'm Someone should crack a joke or something. Like, I, 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 we've, we've never got, been this professional we've before. Got time. I don't really know what we've to do. We've got time for this. We've got um, time for that. Okay. Um, so we should probably bring on our guest for today. You say bring on. This is this is ever so slightly creepy because this is the first time we've we've done this face to face. So usually I'd go, yeah. So Chris, we've we've had some great guests up to now. Who is who is it you're going to introduce me to? But he's he's actually sitting right next to us right now. So, so it's kind of weird that we're talking to each other with him in the room and not bringing him into the conversation. So we're just ignoring him. It's so rude, we probably should bring him in. So let me just turn my chair this way a little bit. Hi Al. Oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Al. Normally what happens is we have a bit of paper to introduce someone that they will provide us all of the information um, about the guest and we have something to work from. But Al hasn't done that because we've kind of just said, oh, free for a podcast. And he said, yeah. Uh, so he's, he's actually asked if we could introduce him and have a go at it, oh, which no. is going to be... This is going to show up the fact that I really haven't done any research for this, Chris, and he's sitting right opposite me so right it's now. Be it's, so it's a nightmare. This is Alan Ruddock. Hi, Al. And he, is, he works at the Sheffield Hallam University. Yep, he does. Um, he's worked there for a long time. And he works with a number of athletes. He's got plenty of experience. He did, he's going to tell me his educational background, um, but he works mainly in strength and conditioning. And he works with the punchy men. He works with the punchy men. He works with boxers at the minute. He's behind Boxing Science, uh, or one of the, the people behind Boxing Science. But he works with top-end athletes. He's worked with a high range of them. And the reason that I know Al is because I actually used him as my coach for a while. I think... When you get to a certain level, um, it's always handy to work with other people. And Al's a very smart guy. So I started working with Al and even coached a few people with him. And he's a very, very smart person. There was a lot about everything. So He's also a torturer, as I remember. Um, yeah. Again, I'm talking about him like he isn't here and he's looking right at me right now, which is really, <laughs> really weird. Um, but yeah, Al made me go on the curve. And that made me do a lot of big swear words while we were getting ready for the ice hole trip. A lot of big swear words. Now, I survived the ice, and I do have to credit him with some of that, but I did a lot of swearing that afternoon. So, cheers for that, Al. So, we're going to actually let Al introduce himself now, and we're going to stop talking, because I think I feel that we've introduced him to his maximum capacity of what we can do. <laughs> yeah, but he's I'm actually spent. He's actually going to tell us who he is, and it's going to sound a lot better than our introduction. This has been an exercise of endurance itself. I'm, uh, I'm out. All right, Al, how are you doing? Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that how was, was that a good for effort. You? It was a good effort, but he, yeah. So I am um, a physiologist. That's so, the word. Yep. So <laughs> I'm I'm interested in how uh, our bodies respond and adapt to exercise. 
Um, so whether that's acutely when I put Will or Chris on, on the curve and make them run until they can run no more on in a VO2 max test. Um, and I look at what we know how their body responds and over time I look at how bodies adapt to exercise and, and training and I've got lots of fancy pieces of kit that I can put on people and in people oh. and look oh. at and look at these the <laughs> responses. I'm glad we didn't get any ins. We, we just got being <laughs> so professional. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you got in in the mouth though. You had <laughs> yeah. you had I'll, mouthpiece. I'll put something in my mouth. <laughs> is what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That> was... <laughs> yeah, I remember that now. That was to check check my uh, maximum expenditure. Was it or yeah, au- auction uptake. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there was that one. I thought I yeah. thought you know the asthma one that they do for. Okay, lung function test. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. I've also had that in my mouth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very true. This is getting really difficult for me to find anything to say that isn't going to get as heavily censored on iTunes. <laughs> so. Carry on, Alan. Carry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of of putting things on people and in people is to is to try and elucidate their strengths and weaknesses, and 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 the goal really is to make somebody's strengths into their super strengths identify those and and make those better and to pick up on any areas for improvement or weaknesses and and make them a little bit better with the overall aim of of improving performance so and it is a massive range of athletes that you deal with isn't it like you deal with endurance athletes a lot but then recently you was working with Kel Brook yeah um, and a couple of other big name fighters and things like that Um, and do you think that there are a lot of similarities across the board with these athletes do you think that a lot of this obviously they'll train different but do you think the main concepts be- behind getting those ad- adaptations are the same or yeah a lot a lot of the the adaptations are the same um it comes down to my training philosophy really why i think a lot of people are the same i have kind of a a, a more general to specific approach than a than a sport specific approach so my my goal is to to look at some strengths and weaknesses and then try and work out how I can make improvements to their the mechanisms that underpin their performance. Mm-hmm. So we all have the same energy systems. Mm-hmm. We all, you know, have the same mechanical properties that enable us to run or cycle. And so it's my job to be able to to pick up on, on what people are good at and what people are not so good at and, and try and improve those mechanisms that underpin performance. So generally my approach to training is is similar for everyone. Uh, mm-hmm. The thing, things that differ are how I would describe and uh, analyse and then prescribe training based upon a sport. So obviously n- the needs of each sport are completely different. Mm-hmm. And so how I describe that, that, that sport uh, and the physiological responses for that sport are completely different from event to event, sport to sport. So let's let's start then by making it endurance based because that'd be handy because that's it's kind of what we do. Yeah, it's kind of what we do. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna we're gonna start yeah. with just endurance based sports and probably actually reach into some of the other clients that you deal with as well. Um, but one of the one of the topics that's come up a lot we've had you'll be our fifth guest and out of the, the four guests prior they've all mentioned the same thing and they've all said that one of the main mistakes that a ultra runner will make. Uh, and what they've even made themselves, and say they made themselves as they've been going through the process, is overtraining, and people basically doing too many miles too soon, or just doing too many miles in general. And I thought we'd kind of start talking about that today, and how our listeners who may be overtraining themselves right now can actually realise that and get the best out of their training. So I thought it's probably best to start with, you know, what is overtraining? What is and it sounds simple, yeah, but, what it, but what actually is overtraining? I think it's important to define the concepts, first of all. Um, I think the, the clearest distinction to make is whether you are overreaching mm-hmm. or whether you are overtraining um, and whether, whether it's acute or whether it's chronic. So whether it's happening for a short period of time or whether it's happening for a long, long period of time. So overreaching uh, or functional overreaching is something um, that you can actually plan into your training calendar, into your training preparation. Um, it's not a bad thing. It means you you are pushing your body to such an extent that it's then causing adaptation. 
Um, but it's important after that period of, of functional overreaching that you have a period of recovery. And that's what most people neglect is the recovery after the functional overreaching that can then tip over into overtraining, which can be rescued, it can be recovered. But if it carries on for too long, then that's when you get chronic overtraining. Um, yeah, and, uh, performance goes uh, down. Yeah, performance goes down, training quality goes down and you're just in a, in a pretty bad place. And coming from a non-coaching background, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty new to all this. It, it is a bit of an alien concept. When you first start, you want to push. Mm. And as you feel that first set of improvements, you, you just want to go out. You want to push those miles. You, you, you feel the pressure to do so. So I think it's it, it's something that I, I wasn't really aware of at the start of my training. And I definitely suffered for that. So... Uh, just just talk us through a little bit how how far should you be pushing yourself how do you how do you know where your limit is when you when you're inexperienced sometimes you you just don't know unfortunately sometimes oh, you have to it. test you're gonna have to just <laughs> test the test the water out you know and make it as safe as possible for you to for you to test that um but for me it comes down to to two main things and that's just planning you know, and making sure your your training intensity and, and training volume are appropriate. If you're starting out, unfortunately, if you don't have a coach, you're not going to have much of an idea of, of, of how to plan training. And uh, the, the other thing is, is, is monitoring training. How are you going to monitor it? How do you know what you're doing is ineffective? Or how do you know what you're doing is ineffective and actually causing you to, to overreach or, or overtrain? Um, and so planning is absolutely key. And then monitoring is key as well. And I think most people realise they might maybe accept that they're overtraining when it's too late. Normally an injury occurs or they they have two or three runs on the bounce or they're trying to break that PB and they just haven't done it in six, seven months and then they start to go like on a, a downwards trend because they're just losing their confidence and things. And it, it, it's just, they then realise, oh, hang on a second, I might be overtraining. But I think um, what... What we're going to try and stress throughout the course of this is, is is how you can effectively plan to avoid that and how you can work on making sure that every training session is is useful and to make sure that every plan and every run that you go on has a purpose. And whether that purpose might be just to go out because you enjoy running, you might be listening to this and you say, oh, I'm just a social runner, I go out because I like the feeling of running and things like that. But if you're a if you're a, a guy or a girl that's listening to this chasing that PB or wanting to be faster or wanting to go further, then it is important to plan, isn't it? And it's really, really important to have a direction in your training. And I think a lot of people miss out on that. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I'm a performance physiologist, so I, I tend not to, when I when I speak, apologies, but I tend not to speak about people who just like to go out for, for mm. a run. Um, yeah, yeah. My end goal is always performance. How are, how are you know... How are you going to win the world championships? How are you going to win Olympic golds? Um, so that's that's always my thinking. It's generally always long term as well. Yeah. Um, so it's not just for six weeks. It's not just to get your your body in shape for for summer. It's you know how are we going to break world records? Mm -hmm. You know how are we going to be the best in the world? And so that's that's where my my thinking comes from. So a lot of these a lot of the the things that we might say in this conversation uh, coming up um, might seem a little bit performance orientated and a little bit uh serious but that's because they are and that's 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 my job it's yeah yeah it's to, to well, for every record, person yeah. i think most of the people here will be actually wanting to tap into that's the reason why we're bringing you on today but let's let's use will hi this is will hi will i'm the bold one <laughs> <laughs> and will um is now at a point of his running career Let's call have, it that. I have a career now. You do now. You've just right. been promoted. Well, he wants to get faster. And it's a whole different thing to what he's been doing over the last couple of months because he's been working on just slowly upping his mileage, becoming more efficient. Yeah. Um, and basically making sure that the distance he covers, he can cover easier. But if you had... Will is like your blank canvas now. How would you start with Will to make him faster? What would be the things that you'd be looking at doing? I would get him in the lab. A lot of... Oh, that. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Just straight in the lab. He'll be stuff in me. <laughs> I guess um, what a lot a lot of people don't do is they don't have like well, you'll buy kit, right? You will buy you'll buy running trainers and you'll spend hours looking looking at the right trying to kind of trainers. Yeah, I love buying you'll spend kit. Spend hundreds 
and if not thousands of pounds on <clears> on kit um but don't really have a budget you'd have a budget for your house you'd have a household budget you'd have a budget for your business be but most people don't have a training budget and they don't have like let's say a thousand pounds five hundred pounds training budget and they will not have anything that says okay i'm going to spend a hundred pounds on on lab testing 150 pounds on lab testing so much on 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 food and supplements um and so kind of for a lot of people the lab testing gets either it's not that people feel it's not accessible or if it's going to be too expensive or it just doesn't feature at all but certainly create a training budget you know and figure out how much you're gonna you're gonna spend because mm. you would do that with like a, a race budget anyway you well, know the, what the you're thing that is, so. i think the thing is just like you look at say for example um you know you start off you buy a pair of trainers you might buy the odd little bit of running but if then you start to take it seriously you're looking at races you're looking at mm. race entry fees you're looking at um you're looking at kit like you say you're buying a pair of road shoes you're buying a mm. pair of trail shoes these could range from 50 to 100 pounds per time and i think what people don't realize and it's off their radar is how cheap some of these lab tests are like a simple yeah. lactate test is is essentially you might want maybe one two a year if that and you can get them for about 100 quid yeah and that one piece of information will be able to tell you all you need to know about what your body is does and how it acts on that time ta- at that moment in time and then from that point on, everything else that you purchase in terms of kit is only going to support or supplements or food or whatever is going to support that that information. So I know that you're a big fan of heart rate training, um, and that that kind of lack, you'll hear you'll read a lot about heart rate training and lactate tests and things like that. Um, and we'll probably bring well for those that haven't heard of it, we'll probably just uh, describe it in a second. But having that budget to to do that I mean it was probably a big game changer for you I should imagine as well Will wasn't it because we just had that information absolutely there. absolutely and I, I, I know what you're saying about budget and as soon as I hear words like that I'm, I'm sort of terrified and it does make it sound big and serious and and uh, you know I don't want to think about my bank balance too much unless I absolutely have to but it's probably terrifying how much money I've just spent on socks in the last year you know and, and you know I, there, there's no reason at all why I couldn't have allocated some of that money into the kind of testing you're talking about. Now, I wouldn't have known <clears throat> to go and do that testing. I wouldn't have known what it was without ex- exposure to you guys. Um, but it's it was immensely useful, and it really was a jumping-off point for my training. Like, at a very early point in my training, we went in for that testing, and you put me on that machine that had 18 different ways of telling me that I was fat. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, that's being mega flippant. Now, you, you could be intimidated by some of the science behind it, and I couldn't claim to understand everything that came out of that session. But what you were able to do was to take that data and interpret it because that's literally what you do for a living and, and give me that jumping off point for the next six months of my training. And that, that was a big turning point for me. And so all, and it, all there's we definitely took, a massive All we took from that was we just got a, a heart rate zone within 10 beats per minute and you stuck to that. And within that, you went from average runner to pretty decent runner within this period of three to four months. It kind of, your last three to four months of training accelerated rapidly compared to the, the nine before. And I know we had a lot to do at the beginning, but it just... It, was a game changer and we, you don't need to do that test again for I wouldn't probably want you to do that for another year or two and I probably what Al's probably in agreement with me unless you had something serious coming up but for those that don't know where to access these things a lot of running shops do them now and yeah. universities have them other facilities all the time so if you're in the Sheffield area and you know you can hit Al up um, <laughs> plug plug <laughs> um, or you know most universities have them now yeah absolutely yeah. and what for those that don't know what a lactate test is and what kind of tests you run. Why don't you just quickly roll through some of the tests that are universally available to most people? Yeah, so I guess the, the first test, just thinking through the, the almost the roll call of tests that we do is a body composition mm-hmm. analysis. Um, so we have something called a segmental body composition analyzer. So we can look at 18 different ways in which Will <laughs> was... Fat. was uh, I was fat. It's fine, like, you say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so we call it the muscle tester, not the not the fat tester. Um, okay, but that's um, half, glass so, half full. It's a really useful. It's a really useful uh, tool um, to see what what changes you can make very very quickly. So simple changes to your diet that can have a, a massive impact on your performance. 
Um, Massive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we can look at uh, lung function uh, and just see whether you know your lungs are, are working properly, your ventilatory system's working okay, it's nice and healthy. Generally, there's not a, a ventilatory limit to performance, i.e. we don't even use all the, the amount of oxygen that we breathe in. We breathe out um, quite a bit of it. And so perhaps at high intensity, that's going to be an issue, but for ultra guys, it's more of a more of a check to see if everything's working okay on the lungs. Um, and then we can do some, some basic blood tests. So we can look at hemoglobin, so that's the oxygen carrying part of, of the red blood cell. And we can look at how much red, red, packed red blood cells you have uh, in your blood as well in relation to your plasma, um, which is interesting from uh, the, uh, the a heat acclimation point of view, which we might get onto to later. Mm. Uh, then the lactate test is three minutes of running uh, with one minute recovery. And that one minute recovery is just so I can take a little fingertip blood sample and. I then use that to I pop in a machine and that tells me blood lactate. Now lactate starts to appear uh, when you get a little bit tired. Unfortunately, there's a massive bugbear of mine, is that lactate has been labelled the bad guy for too many years. Stop doing it. The lactate is actually Stop being a lactatist, guys. La yeah, yeah, don't guys. be guys. It. It's terrible. <laughs> but yeah, lactate's not the bad guy. Uh lactate is used as a as a fuel. Um but I guess it's been made the bad guy because we can measure it in the blood and uh, very easily and it's implicated with fatigue. So you'll hear people say, oh, lactate, you know, I feel the burn because of lactate. No, you feel the burn probably because um, your muscles have been more, have got more acidic uh, and so that is why you feel the burn. It's not because of the lactate. But nevertheless, lactate uh, is a good indicator of you feeling the burn and then and then getting fatigued uh, and so that's why we measure it. So during that three minute test we can also look at substrate utilization so we can look at the amount of carbohydrate that you're using as a fuel and the amount of fat that you're using as a fuel. For, for you ultra guys we want you to be using a high proportion of, of fat as a fuel as mm -hmm. opposed to carbohydrate because we've got a, a limited amount of, of carbohydrate and of muscle glycogen which would need to be replaced quite a lot. So we'll be looking at how well you use fat and how well you use carbohydrate, and then things like oxygen uptake, uh, which can tell us a little bit about running economy. And after that, we would do a VO2 max test. So that's the test where we would run you until you can run no more. That's why we wear the harness. So if you do fall, uh, because you can't turn your legs over anymore, you don't scrape your face against the, the treadmill belt. But that gives an indication of, of I said you were a torturer. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even the worst of it, though, is it? No, no, it's not. <laughs> um, that gives us an indication of how much the, <clears throat> and a maximum capacity for you to to take in and utilize oxygen um, to make your your legs move, uh, and then we can reference quite a lot of the the measurements that we're getting from the lactate profile against that, and we can tweak a few things and work out where you where you're strong and, and where you need to improve a little bit based upon based upon all those so it's, it's really comprehensive it gives us a good insight into where someone is 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 relatively strong so we can make them even stronger we can make them into super strengths and we can build people's areas of improvement up and and get them to their strengths yeah and i think what that information importantly it, it does more than anything is just give you that it it's as a as a runner as well especially if you've kind of been patterning around the same kind of results for a while once you have that information in front of you you might not necessarily know how to how to make it better but that's where a decent coach would then just say this is how you make it better and then you've got that foundation to start with then that you then just go out and the world is your oyster and i think it just means that every training session you do is a lot more useful i think that was the thing that i i got better results off the back of that test in running six hours a week than i did 14 hours a week you know and it that on its own was... it's that thing you said at the start about about having a focused yeah uh, a focused a about having a focus <laughs> like a, a unfocused training is it can just be really unproductive mm. and I had to sort of find that out the hard way just bumbling along for my first couple of months once the first round of testing was done I don't know what a lot of those numbers mean and you say some fantastic words and, like, <laughs> and I, I had such a good day when I did that testing because I did find it also interesting but I can't necessarily 
like just jump off straight away and interpret all of those results myself. But showing them to you, you're like, oh yeah, you should be doing this. Mm. And and it just immediately, I had a couple of easy to understand targets and I dug in and did them for the next few weeks. And you, you just see this massive upturn in what you're getting back out of the training you're putting in. It's, it, I, I can yeah. bang on about this all day. I, that, that's the thing. If people are considering whether to do this kind of test or not, and one of the one of the negatives is like, oh, it just overcomplicates things. Running should just be simple and stuff like that. But if you're generally looking at getting better, it kind of simplifies things in a way because you just then end up with the raw data that you need. You then go work on the basics, and that's what tends to happen. You get the information, you actually end up taking a step back and working on the basics, and it reminds you to set you know regular habits to improve your body composition, you know, uh, and making sure that you recover well enough for each session so when you do train the the session's worthwhile and things like that so maybe it's just one of those things that like Al says you start budgeting for something like that it could be a game changer for you um, and hey you might not end up by paying for loads of physio <laughs> if, yeah, you're, yeah. if you're one of those guys it's like god damn it you know you've got an account with the local physio possibly because yeah. you're overtraining. maybe this might be an investment to, to save on that the but. unfocused part of my training early on I was definitely spending the kind of money on treatment that I should have spent on understanding my body in the first place. Yeah, rather than preventing the, yeah. the thing in the first place, you was you was trying to cure it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So but, yeah, so that's so I have like a like a three pronged up approach, I guess. Um, just describe. So this is describing you as a performer and, and try to describe the, the sport, uh, and then it's prescribe. So from, from these tests, we can work out training zones. And so we can make it really simple and just have three training zones. And you spend a lot of time in zone one and a bit of time in zone three and hardly any time in zone two, which is no man's land, which is where people spend a Most lot of time. time. Yeah, so because basically, you don't train yeah. easy enough yeah. when you're supposed to, so you, you tip into a harder session. And then you don't train hard enough when you're supposed to train hard. So a lot of people end up in zone yeah. two, in no man's land, a lot of time in no man's land. So the, really the most effort. common thing for that is, rather than having an easy run, people will start off with an easy run, then start taking their pace too high, which puts them into this gray area. So no adaptations or a watered down yeah. adaptation. So they do, they don't, their body doesn't know what, what to do in that way. Or they go for a hard session, but that hard session ends up being like an hour and a half, or it ends up being 45 minutes where they finish the session and, they, yeah, they're tired, but they're not exhausted. So once again, not high enough. And that's, I think, if you're one of these people that goes out for a one-hour run and puts reps into them and things like that, this is what you're saying now is that your results are being watered down because you're not either low or high. Um, but I think what people don't the thing I learned quite quickly I think from, from working with you is what high actually is um, and I think people I think you was the same way when we started doing this kind of training with you, you just didn't accept that six minutes was a, a yeah. reasonable amount of time to train in, in it, a high it's end it's counterintuitive You're like yeah. well I'll be longer in the changing rooms at the gym than I will do in anything yeah. I, I couldn't get around yeah. but well, you'll, you'll probably help to explain this better than, or you will be able to explain it better than I will. But what I was trying to get across to Will was if you're in a high enough work rate, you won't be able to go past six, 10, 12 minutes. You know, you, you'll be ready to throw up, quit, and want to be done by then. And I think a lot of endurance athletes don't see that as a. I think they'll do an hour long track session instead, where if they, if they worked properly for 10, 20 minutes, then they would get more adaptation and a better result from that. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it takes it takes me longer to think about and plan a training session than it does to actually carry out a training session. Hmm. Much much longer. Um, but yeah, certainly the most people don't push themselves hard enough, and I think that's more a case of they don't believe that they can they can go to those places. So when we train in boxers. When we're when we're getting the guys to to run at these kinds of intensities, yes, we're getting a physiological and mechanical benefit, but we're also getting a psychological benefit as well, because they're pushing themselves so hard to this dark, horrible place where they don't want to be, um, and their opponents definitely not going, and so it has this this psychological benefit to it as well, and just gives you so much so much strength to know that you've been to almost to hell 
and back. And once you do it recover is. and get your, your senses back, it does feel great, but at the time. But I was, I was surprised at how big, like for example, when, when I was on the curve with you, you was, it was basically 30 seconds on, two, two minute 30 off. Yeah. Like for six. Yeah. So six 30 second blasts with a two minute 30 rest period. And you think like there'll be runners there listening to that going, easy. I'd, I've been through this when I you started me on sprint sessions which yeah. is this high end thing we're talking about and you started me off on sprint sessions and I didn't get what you were talking to me about then I did them yeah. and I hated you um, <laughs> and then other people started asking me about them like what, what are these posts you're putting up of you looking like you're going to die in the gym and I started explaining it to other people like what I was doing was 35 seconds on a minute off 8 reps generally on a rower sometimes on the bike hate the bike <laughs> um, but I'm explaining it to people and they're going 35 that's nothing that is nothing but then, and then they go in the gym and I get messages from them saying what have you done to me yeah. like, well there's two ways you can row for 35 seconds yeah. there's your all out and then the all out that you can that is a lot more than that that, yeah. that you are actually capable of and I think when people know that and we do have to say be careful folks I don't want any kind of like you know, 80 year old bloke <laughs> listening to this going, right, Chris said I'm going to get my heart rate to 500, let's go. Um, but it's that thing of if you've worked at a high intensity, your session shouldn't be 45 minutes to an hour unless it involves a hell of a lot of stretching or that kind of nervous walking around. Like that's, that's what I find. You know, say so it takes you longer to plan, it takes me longer to physically get onto the bike or the rower or the curb or the, the track thinking about. And the nerves thinking, oh, this is going to feel horrible. But then that mindset of, I've only got 30 seconds, it has to be everything that I have. And that means that heart rate goes flying up, means that we actually get the adaptation. We're giving the body the stimulus. Stimuli? Stimulus? Stimuli. 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 St- yeah. Everything's been stimulated. <laughs> but the adaptation then, then occurs, I guess. Yeah. It's been, uh, and it's having a clear signal as well. Having a, having a quality training session with a very clear signal so it's, it's not being mixed or, or diluted at all and when i talk about uh, signal um, i'm talking about cell signaling responses so what happens to the cell um, and what happens to the the mechanisms after it has received this this signal that causes the adaptation um, and the so the noise the noise would be um, if you were to train a little bit easier or to, to train at a lactate threshold and then do this type of session, it would it just all gets too confusing from the cell. It's not really optimizing uh, any any signals. It's not clear. And so you're probably going to get a dampening of that adaptive response. So it's, it's about having a quality session, knowing what the goal of the session is uh, and sticking to the plan. And, you know, with the, with the, the theme and the concept of overreaching and overtraining, which generally occurs because of high volume, uh, high number of miles at kind of a junk type intensity, junk miles. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, this is going to tie you out well before you get into to junk mile mm-hmm. status. Uh, and so it's actually, although it might sound horrible uh, and just just terrible, uh, and you think it might cause overreach and overtraining, it actually prevents it from happening because you're restricted by the, the, the physically the amount of, of, of volume you can do. So rather than being at this relatively high intensity for a longer period of time, you're at a really high intensity for a very short period of time, or you're at a very low intensity for a long period of time, therefore reducing the risk of injury. And once you've planned that in, yep. you've, you've got your low intensity sessions, you know how much you want to achieve of that in a week, your high intensity session, you know how much you're going to punish yourself for 20 or 30 minutes or whatever in the gym. It, that's when you stop doing the, you know what, I'm just going to clock up 16 hours this week yeah. in the middle where I'm working probably harder than I should be, but not really at a high intensity level either yeah. and not necessarily achieving anywhere near as much. Probably it's enjoying expensive. yourself. I'm not saying, yeah. you know, never go out and enjoy I your think run, those but that kind, of that mid, kind of focus is important. Those grey area runs are actually quite useful if you're getting race ready because that's probably going to be your race place. So, you know, you look at someone, I was looking at someone's race the other day on Strava and they're av- they, did a, they did a half marathon and their average heart rate was 170. That's a high intensity run that if they didn't do any kind of runs like that in training, it would be useless. But that should be it. Close to a race, you should in- in- introduce a couple of 
at pace or what you plan to do pace yeah. runs. But outside of that, stick to the low or high rule. And what kind of ratio should people be doing? Well, so low to high. Yeah, well, first of all, the half marathon is bang in the middle of no man's land. Mm. So when people go out and, and, and choose to do a run with no real intention, um, it will be somewhat hard. So we have a, a we use something called a rating of perceived exertion scale, which is rated from 6 to 20. And I hold it up in people's faces after every three minute intervals just to check to see how, how hard it is. And generally people go for somewhat hard and feel too hard and feel too easy. But, you know, a, a half marathon would be run at an RP of about 13, which is smack bang in the middle of no man's land. And if you're training for a half marathon, then go out and do some do some runs at an RP of 13 where you feel it's somewhat high, where you feel that's your, your pace. Because if you're not doing that and you want to compete at a half marathon, then you're ignoring the principle of specificity. Hmm. So not saying don't do it, um, but it just depends on, on where you are in your training phase and what your, your training goal is for that that uh, your adaptive goal is for that training phase yeah. so in general when we talk about do loads of stuff in uh, at low intensity and do a little bit of stuff at high intensity um, there are some very good researchers that have termed this model the polarized training approach where you spend 80 percent of your training time in zone one and 20 percent in zone three in reality um, you're never going to spend completely 20 percent in in zone three because you have to transition from zone one to zone two and then to zone three mm -hmm. if you're quantifying it strictly um so there will always be a little bit in there and anyway it's ignoring the principle of specificity so you should be spending maybe 75 5 15 mm. my math's right there yeah it's right in it 75 yeah, yeah. Five. no no it's 75 it. 5 20 yeah yeah yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no way. The five, no, the five. That extra five percent is for red zone and dead zone runs, which we haven't touched on yet. Okay. I'll speak to you guys later about that. <laughs> <Okay>. All right. <laughs> secret, <laughs> secret red zone that no one knows about. But it's probably important as well to mention that there are a number of ways to get a heart rate zone. So for those that are listening, that go, I heart rate run. They might be familiar with a one to five. Oh yeah. So there might be like a zone one, two, three, four. And what we're arguing with this is technically five is at the top end, um, one is at the bottom end, but they have a two, three, four. And in our opinion, yeah. the two, three, four is often a waste of time unless it's race specific. Yeah. Um, so what we tend to do is a one, two, three, and two is your race specific. Yeah. Uh, I say we, it's mainly you. I, I learned this one from you. Um, but yeah, that that is pretty much it. So if you're... If you're heart rate training at the minute or you're interested in it, we can do a bit of a Q&A on this. I think this is probably going to be something that quite a lot of people might have a couple of questions on. Yeah, we might need to open this one up. Yeah, because I think if you've not heard about heart rate training and your interest has been sparked by this, you've probably got more questions. If you do heart rate training and think, oh, I want to learn more about these other principles, then once again. So we might do a live Q&A on this at, at some point. Um, but let's, um, let's quickly move towards... So we, we've kind of... Um, talks about overtraining and how to avoid it. Uh, let's talk about how you can maximise recovery mm. uh, because this is a thing that a lot of people will run, run stops, and as much as I'm a social runner in the fact that I like to finish in a pub or yep, finish, uh, finish in some kind of establishment that serves fish and chips. Get any large amount of food. Yeah, basically. like most of our yeah. long runs were planned around where we could eat some kind of food or drink some kind of beer. Yeah. So, um, and it's a common thing, but... When people turn their watch off, once they get in and have a shower, that's it then. Their, their run is done and they kind of switch out of run mode and turn back into dad, mum, whatever. But there's actually a large window between the next run where they can maximise their recovery. And how? what do you think is the best ways to do that? It depends. <laughs> oh, no, go on. Well, Let me pose this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll, well, I'll say this. Do you want to recover? Y yes. My instinct is yes. But go on. I feel like there's more to this because if you uh, if you're in a training phase where you're not you're not too interested in about recovery because you want to maximize adaptive signals then why would you want to recover if you have an opportunity to to place even more strain on physiology and and get even more adaptations from that 
Ruddock with a curveball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm quiet. That doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> so if you... Okay, so if you've... Let's say you've done... Uh, let's give Lactate a bad name again. So if you've There's done... There's a song there. If you <laughs> give Lactate a bad name... <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Get on the drum kit, Will. <laughs> yeah. Hey. So you've done a session, and your intention of the session is is to induce uh, a high magnitudes of blood lactate. Okay, uh, and that is the the primary means in which you are um, grading training quality. And we Run do to get sessions. knackered. We do those. Okay. We do these these things at the university quite a bit, um, and then you do a a warm down afterwards. You do a cool down afterwards, uh, and that's and that's designed to let's give it a bad name again to flush away the lactate. Okay, because you know that's that's what people would do. Why would you do that if your aim, if the adaptive aim is to induce lactate and the high magnitudes of acidosis? Why would you want to be helping your body? from from removing that kind of strain if that's that's the goal of the session so you first of all you got to ask yourself some, do, do ask yourself do i want to recover fully from this session um another example if you are training twice a day all right um and you do a or let's say you're training in the evening or in the morning if you do a a training session in the in the morning uh, and it's one hour two hour long and then you don't fully recover from it, then if you do a, a high intensity session in the, in the evening, uh, then there are some piece of research that would suggest that not fully recovering improves the adaptive response to the to the hit training in the evening. And the same with if you do hit training in the, in the evening and then do a morning session of volume, it has, has a similar type effect as well. And if you train fasted, it has a similar type effect effect as well and if you restrict carbohydrate after training doing a long run it does the same thing again so it improves the adaptive signal so the, the first question is do I want to recover fully or do I want to prolong the adaptive signals and another way you can do it which is what we've done with the boxes is after a track session we've actually got them we've done this with you actually we've got them in hot hot baths so hot baths which we call ball burners because they are very <laughs> hot <laughs> Right. They are hot. They're... They burn your genitals. Okay, I, 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 <laughs> it's another a... one of his sick tests. <laughs> he just burns your genitals. The bath, the bath is torture. The, 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 the bath only sits around waist height. That's why. <laughs> why do you like hurting people? Like, there's a whole other podcast here where we have some kind of therapy session and dig into what happened in your past. <laughs> what makes you want to do these things? It's not called. It's not the same title. This is it. <laughs> This is not a BTU podcast, <laughs> but, um, but that what we're trying to do there is we're trying to provide a, a passive stimulus um, to prolong the buzz of, of training. So when we've got an athlete who's got a, a very high training load and we haven't got very long, uh, much time to train them, we need to squeeze out every possible little uh, and, me- and make sure we're maximising every possible little opportunity to, to get the adaptation. So... One of the things that we do is, is stick them in a hot bath, get them hot, uh, and the heat on the muscle just prolongs the buzz. It, it, it keeps the energy state of the muscle high, and so uh, these I keep talking about these adaptive signals, but these 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 signals that cause adaptation are just left buzzing and simmering for a little while longer after the training session. So you could argue that it's not recovering then either. So I suppose it's all about getting that fine balance, isn't it? Because like you say, if people want to recover quicker, then they can do a little bit of a cool down. They can take some rested time. They can work on their diet. They can sleep well. They can rehydrate. You know, These are the kind of things that will maximise your recovery, which means that the next training session, you're more likely to be ready to rock. You're more likely to get... Um, you're more likely to be in a better mental state as well and ready to, to get that and get an adaptation there or you can go with the opposite approach where you can almost keep your body tired but I suppose that runs a risk of injury I absolutely suppose. yeah it needs to be properly prescribed and, and supervised and it needs to be monitored as well and mm. really closely monitored 
Um, so it's one of those things I'd say if you're to, new to this, then don't do it. <laughs> go go about yeah, go about maximising your recovery. But if you're an experienced athlete that wants to get that extra those extra bits of yeah. results and things, then maybe consider how it's high risk, high, high reward yeah. in a planned way. Then yeah. there has to be that oh, yeah. kind of monitoring. Yeah, it's yeah. not a case of don't don't cool down, jump in a hot bath. And then go out and, and do that every don't damn eat. day. Do that don't every, eat. <laughs> yeah, don't eat and do that every day yeah. until you know it's got to be. It's got to be done in a tactical, clever way. Yeah, I, I think my experience is <clears> from that high performance, that elite, elite level, um, and so we have we have support structures in in place and appropriate planning and procedures to be able to do that kind of thing without it being an issue. Or if we if we see it becoming an issue, we can. We can pull things and we can tweak and we can change things in terms of the training load um, before it does ever get to be a, a pretty serious issue. But yeah, so the question is, do you want to recover or, or do you not? So some of the things that like you can do to recover um, straight away after a, after a long run is make sure you get your nutrition right and your hydration right. Um, it's things that people don't get right in the first place a lot of the time. No, you know, they, don't, they don't even get the hydration and the nutrition right day to day in order to get the best out of the training. Absolutely, so yeah. start with the basics, start with the foundations, form habits, mm. and then progress yeah. from yeah. there. So I want to kind of finish with a couple of things. Um, there's, I, I want a quickish answer if you can, because I saw an article the other day um, dissing ice baths, saying that they don't work and that the new research is, is saying that they don't work. Um, I want a quick kind of answer on that. Uh, and then the second one being, um, I'm gonna, I'm, it's gonna be boxing related. I have to ask about a couple okay. of fights coming yeah. up, <laughs> <laughs> and get your. I'm a betting man. I, I want to know. Uh, but yeah, ah, ice the punchy man. Yeah, ice ice baths. Okay. Yay or nay? <sighs> Don't depends. say depends. He's gonna say depends. <laughs> <laughs> Come and sit down. Yeah. Okay. Damn it. Right. Um, the problem is when people see isolated studies and make decisions on them, it's not helpful for anyone. Mm. It's not helpful for anyone in the scientific community. It's not helpful for anyone that's looking to make decisions based upon those studies. Spot science studies generally have low sample sizes. So, you know, you talk, if you're lucky, you're going to get a study with 15, 20, 20 people in it. Um, and so it makes interpreting the results from, from those studies across to um, the population difficult for one thing uh, and another thing it makes it difficult to translate that information from scenario to scenario sport to sport circumstance to circumstance so when you when you see articles wherever they are and they are citing a single study then try not to pay too much attention to them if however you are able to distinguish between a single research study and a uh, a review or something called a meta-analysis then pay attention to those a little bit more because what those do is they will take a body of, of evidence and try and contextualize it as much as possible and then only after there's been four five six seven eight plus up to however 50 studies uh, my colleagues just done um, only after there's a bank of evidence, then we can start to be confident about, about what we see. But in terms of the eye study, um, I think, it, did it blunt endurance yeah, response? Yeah, basically. It blunted it, but, um, but heat might help it. Hmm. Um, but I think there's only been like three or four, three or four studies done so far. Um, so ice might so be helpful no for... Well, no, I, ice, no, I think this ice was helpful for endurance, but not for strength. I think it blunted um, strength. Okay. Um, so, but yeah. Not enough is known. Not enough is known, unfortunately. Okay. Which I, is I, I, we're really holding out for a yes or no answer. In there, terms right? of re in terms of a recovery method, um, people obviously people people get themselves in ice baths um, all the time. Uh, people hate it because it's like four, two, three, four degrees Celsius. You don't need to be going that cold. If you want to recover in a in an ice bath, go 10, 12, 15 degrees Celsius. You don't need to go that cold. And the thing to remember is, and with all recovery methods, is that if it makes you feel good, it will work. 
So yeah. just I, I I I I can vouch for that and say like when people say oh it doesn't work it doesn't work it's like I I have finished marathons and stuck my my lower body into cold not uh, not four degrees cold but cold water just a bath with cold water in and I I might have been it might have been after a race so I'm, a couple of hours after a race I'm hobbling about because all the things are starting to seize up got into that then out of that car bath into like a hot shower yeah. and I'm walking around like I've not done anything for a yeah. couple of hours. So you can't you can't lie against that. That right. gave me a temporary pain relief almost. Whether it goes back again once I fall to sleep and wake back up and feel like I'm yeah. I've been raped by the devil. But <laughs> <laughs> or Al in this way in his, in his torture device. I tune I also remember you sign informed consents when we do stuff as well. So you sign my life and then so quickly, I can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> quickly before I finish off with the question that's going to decide on who I bet on, um, I just want to also, if people haven't read it yet, you wrote an article for us about cramp, mm. um, which I it kind of when we started doing a magazine, we kind of started and put loads of effort into a magazine and didn't get the response we wanted. So we're going to do a quarterly one instead, um, which summarizes a load of these podcasts and things like that. But it is still there, and we'll put it into the link of this podcast if we can. Is that possible? Yes, I will do that. Good. Uh, I had to look at tech guy to sort that. But can you just quickly go, uh, I don't know if you can remember the article that you wrote for us, but just a lot of people don't know what cramp is, what causes cramp and what prevents it. If you want to just quickly. Uh, it, could like four, it could be like a 40 minute discussion. I know that, but yeah, we can yeah. quickly. No, neither do a lot of scientists. Scientists don't know. Um, so the early, so you might think that uh, the general, con- uh, shall I say misconception? So the general feeling is that cramp is caused by a loss of electrolytes and uh, and electrolytes are lost through sweat and this is why loads of people take salt tablets. Nah, this is why people yeah. take salt tablets mm-hmm. um they could be quite easily be a placebo mm-hmm. so this association um came from studies that were done on um mining uh, in hot and humid mining, mining, yeah, in like the early 1900s. You know, so a lot of people were getting heat illness yeah. uh, and uh, heat syncope, so they were just feeling generally faint and dizzy um, in the mines. And obviously that was affecting productivity. Um, so the the mine owners were interested in trying to improve in, in, in productivity. So they got guys in thermal physiologists to try and um, and another physiologist to try and improve the way that the the workforce could deal with the heat. Uh, and one of the things that they found, and this was just by correlation, so it was just correlate correlative studies, was um, the guys that were getting cramp also had high sweat sodium levels. And so this has been just th- this thinking just being perpetuated um, and iterated several feels like million times, and, and until you get to sports drinks. And so sports drinks have electrolytes in. Um, and the association has then continued with marketing. So obviously now, when you get when when you, if you think you're going to get cramp, you take a you take a salt tablet, and that stops cramp. And um, it might actually not be the case, and it's it, it's probably not because it it occurs case by case. But the current thinking in the scientific community is that it's probably not related to to salt. Uh, because a lot of it's reabsorbed anyway through through the sweat glands, but is due to um, the ability of of the neurons that control muscle action just probably misfiring and get a little bit fatigued, or getting strained because another area close to it is not mobile, is not strong enough to to deal with that, and so that's why why you get cramp, um, or just overuse. So if you get mobile and you get strong. And uh, you suffer from cramp. Doing those two things might help more than taking a salt tablet. Hmm. Wow! I find, I, I'm not going to mention. I nearly mentioned his name then, but one of one of the clients that we've dealt with, um, if if he was kneeling down and um, crunch his toes up, he'd get cramp all across his bottom of his feet, hamstrings, everything like that, because it was an unfamiliar movement pattern to him. It's a sign that his body didn't know how to deal with it, and it just cramp. But he also had problems with his Achilles, problems with his hamstrings, moving and making him stronger and that, all, all cramping, all injuries gone. For now. Touch wood. Yep. Um, so that's it. You know, you might not have to smash all these salt tablets. I spent so much money on salt tablets. <laughs> <laughs> my, my training budget is all wrong. <laughs> it's just treatment and salt. Hydration's important. And, and getting your electrolytes right are 
are a fine art yeah. in themselves, but it, whether it's related to cramp is a yeah is a different it's thing. Really if anything, yeah. a lot of people over salt. Yeah. Um, that can um, cause stomach salty. stomach issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is a common problem as well. But anyway, to finish with Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather, who's your money on? Money. <laughs> yeah, money no way there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah. Right. So, um, you obviously at Boxing Science deal with boxers all the time, but you also write and study and almost act like a journalist to some yeah. to some fights and stuff. Um, what what can you say about Mayweather and, and Conor McGregor? That's going to be a big fight, right? So we're in the middle of writing an article uh, which is how could Conor McGregor beat Floyd Mayweather? Um Many people think it's just not possible. Um, he's got a very, very slim chance. They're still human. They're still a piece of meat slugging it out against each other. So, you know, as long as one of them's, you know, still still breathing, the other one's got a chance. And Mayweather's Mayweather will almost definitely win. But from the analysis that we've been we've been doing, we've worked out that Mc, McGregor has to increase the volume of his punches by 55% to be able to to get to the the levels of which get the, let me make it so this is clear so Mayweather's most closely contested fight in recent years was against was against a guy called Marcos Maidana and uh, his tactic was a high pressure high volume approach to to punch in. So he put him under a lot of pressure and he threw a lot of punches. So in order to match him, based upon McGregor's last five fights, he would have to increase his activity by 55%. And obviously that has a lot of um, implications for conditioning, um, particularly when you consider that the rounds are a decrease from five minutes in UFC to three minutes. But there's boxing. more of them. But there's more of them. And the ring size as well. The ring size is a, is a lot smaller, which means that the, oh, as, along with the tactics, the um, the close combat creates a different, more of different types of muscle action. So that changes the energy demands as well, and the considerations for strength training. So unless he goes in swinging, fifty five percent more volume of shots. Yeah, and he's training to arm. do that. He's yeah. training to do and that. He's, and, he, and he has trained to do that mm -hmm. um, yeah. in a particular way. But uh, if I give was, you a shout, shouldn't he? You're going to drop, this, the, uh, drop this article the, as well. Give the shout. Well, we, um, <laughs> we're also we're, we're running a, a combat conditioning online conference. Um, see if he turns up to that. See if he turns up. But we've got Conor McGregor's S&C coach. Have you? On, on, the, on the conference. So, oh, okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, get anything out of him there. But... Yeah, our approach would be a high volume, and that that obviously has specific conditioning implications. To do. Yeah, but if I was Mayweather, I'd be leaving it to the very last minute to to announce a fight from a, a tactical perspective, and just give him a little time to prepare. Like, hey, that's what he did with Pacquiao. Hmm. So he had the eight weeks to train for that. It's so it's Monday. I'll I'll fight you Friday. <laughs> <laughs> he has the power to do it, I suppose, yeah. isn't it? Well, that's it. Brilliant. Bloody awesome as always. Got, yeah, a, got I, some betting tips as well while we're here. Yeah, you've got what you want out of it. That's, that's <laughs> absolutely fantastic. What did you want? Well, I'll try and help now. Big words. Um, I've really enjoyed all the big words. I I meant what I said earlier. The, the testing that, that I, I came and did with you was absolutely brilliant for me. I just I've, I find it so interesting. And I'm sort of incrementally starting to understand more and more about it by going out and applying what you've told me to apply based on that data. And it's it's been amazing for me. So, yeah. This was just another excuse to seal ourselves in a weird room with you for an hour. Again, we come back to that sort of mm. torture changer chamber vibe from earlier. Yeah, it's, it's, a bit torture, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit creepy. But yeah, we'll we'll post the <clears throat> article in. Uh, just, I'll post yeah, the Will article. Will post Chris. the article. In. <laughs> Um, and just to remind you as well, obviously I asked at the beginning, but you can review us on iTunes, you can subscribe, hit all the subscribe buttons that are about, even if you're on social media or on Twitter and Facebook and all that now, we are a modern company. A big up to our listeners in Ghana. Yeah, apparently somebody downloaded in Zambia, so you know, yeah, hello, yeah, yeah, really good, <laughs> really, really glad somebody's out there listening to us, this is brilliant. And we will see you next time for episode six, who, I can't remember who it is shamefully.
<laughs> that's a bad note to end on, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Still, that's it. Episode right. six is going to be good, whatever it is. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>